A few days ago from when I'm making this video, NASA released an incredibly gorgeous video. It's essentially the video of the most iconic picture from the Hubble telescope, the Pillars of Creation. And in this case, it's actually a new visualization that kind of takes us on a three-dimensional tour of what these unusual features might look like if you were to see them from different perspectives. And though the video itself is obviously really awesome and presents this iconic image in an extremely different light, or I guess from an extremely different angle, one thing that this image does not do is actually tell us anything about these features and why they look the way they look. And I guess more importantly, why they are actually crucial in our understanding of how everything in a galaxy forms. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video I actually wanted to do, I guess, a bit of an explanation of what exactly we're looking at, why these pillars are called pillars of creation, and why this might actually represent pretty much the beginning for most of the stars out there in the entire universe. And so let's discuss pillars of creation in a little bit more detail and talk about this iconic formation from a more scientific perspective. Although naturally, if you want to see the video by itself, the link for this is in the description below. But I guess first, so where is this and can you actually see it with a telescope? Well, technically, I guess you could if you had a powerful enough telescope, but it would be extremely difficult because this particular nebula, known as the Eagle Nebula, is approximately 7,000 light years away from us. And in a 2.2 meter telescope, it resembles something like this. But obviously, if you zoom in, you can kind of see the pillars right in the center. But these unusual pillars technically have a different name. They're sometimes referred to as elephant trunks, but more officially are basically known as cold molecular pillars. And that's because they're made out of cold neutral hydrogen that's very often found in a lot of molecular clouds out there. But not all clouds will possess these pillars. And so there's actually something really special that needs to happen for a lot of these elephant trunks or these pillars to start forming. And that something has to be an extremely powerful star. And that's because these objects only form when there is a massive O-type or B-type star that's able to produce super intense radiation somewhere inside the cloud. And so basically, as soon as something like this happens inside some kind of a molecular cloud, which obviously happens quite a lot because a lot of these massive stars just form when a lot of gas suddenly collapses into a single point, that's when these stars start to dramatically change the cloud. They basically, first of all, start to ionize hydrogen, but also produce a lot of stellar wind that blows a lot of this gas away. And this has been observed in pretty much all of the molecular clouds out there, with some of the best examples visible in the Orion Nebula, or technically in the Orion Molecular Cloud that possesses a lot of these formations. But because these clouds are not really uniform and do contain a lot of overdensities, or basically a bunch of clumps everywhere, some of this gas does not get ionized equally and does not get expelled from the cloud. And so many of these clumps start to basically form these chunky formations that actually end up blocking everything behind them as well, just because the light from that particular star does not get through. And as they basically block this light, everything behind these clumps does not get affected either and thus starts to form these unusual pillars. And so essentially, if the star is located somewhere right here and is shining powerful light toward this direction, because of the unusual clump in this location, everything behind the clump gets blocked, producing the unusual pillar. And so each of these pillars is really the result of various powerful O and B type stars having their light blocked by these somewhat dense molecular objects. And it's not like one or two, there's actually quite a few of these overdensities that eventually start to coalesce into something a little bit thicker. As a matter of fact, as a result of the stellar wind and as a result of this powerful radiation, a lot of these clumps eventually start to slowly collapse. Here's a really cool schematic showing us how all of this happens. And these tiny collapsing points start to produce what the scientists refer to as eggs, or I guess EGGs, evaporating gaseous globules. And so on top of each of these pillars, that's basically a bunch of tiny eggs. And so even the naming here is very symbolic. These pillars of creation end up producing these eggs that do actually hatch into something else. And if you do zoom in on one of these images, you'll see there are quite a lot of them visible as these individual protrusions that seem to stretch toward the star. And for this cloud, all of this roughly looks like this. We have several massive ionizing stars a few light years away, 
we have the ionization fronts at the tips of the pillars, the molecular cloud behind that's not as affected by the light from the stars, and of course a lot of ionized hydrogen in between. But it's really what happens to these eggs after that's super exciting. They don't just form these trunks or these unusual pillars, they eventually start forming something entirely different. After about 100,000 years, because of the tremendous power from these stars, they eventually are forced to collapse into what's known as proplids. And we've talked about proplids in one of the recent videos based on the observations from the James Webb Space Telescope. And if you watched that video, you probably already know where this is going. Proplids are basically protostars. And so each of these individual eggs eventually becomes a protoplanetary system because of this unusual collapse that's forced on them by these powerful stars. And as the gravity pulls these objects tighter and tighter, they actually collect even more material from the outside, which eventually condenses into larger objects and within a few hundred thousand years becomes a young stellar object. Not a star yet, but a soon-to-be star. But I guess what's even more intriguing is that this is not the end of the story yet, and that's because all of these massive stars that initiated all of this eventually go supernova. And as they go supernova, they eject a lot of heavier materials and also potentially destroy the cloud, dispersing some of the stars in the process, but most importantly, enriching everything around them with a lot of heavier elements that eventually end up in various planets. And though not all proplets are going to become stars, and some might just become brown wars, Quite a lot of them do become stellar objects, eventually initiating nuclear reaction and becoming typical stars. And so based on a lot of studies from the Pillars of Creation, here scientists have already confirmed at least 73 eggs, but surprisingly only 15% of them seem to currently show signs of protoplanetary systems, other ones might be just too young or not massive enough and thus might become brown dwarfs or extremely small star systems. But each of them contains a lot of these objects, which essentially means that quite a lot of stars are eventually going to be produced here within the next 100,000 years. And so by itself, despite this being just a beautiful picture, it's also literally a picture that shows us the creation of everything in our galaxy. Because most stars out there extremely likely went through this process. All of this started in a molecular cloud, with the next step being some kind of a large massive star suddenly releasing a lot of light producing pillars, and inside of these pillars a lot of different eggs first became proplets, then became young stellar objects, and eventually became stars. And as you can imagine, there's actually a lot of evidence that this is exactly what happened to the sun. As a matter of fact, based on the evidence from ancient meteorites, there are a lot of signs that there was a supernova near the sun right as the solar system was about to finish forming. This is usually found by looking at various isotopes, especially the ones usually produced by various supernova, and the evidence from meteorites is very strong. And of course, if these studies are correct, this definitely gives us a slightly different perspective when visualizing these incredible objects. This is literally like looking back in time four and a half billion years ago, when some kind of a different massive star was sculpting the molecular cloud where the solar system was about to form, and eventually forced one of these eggs to slowly coalesce into the future solar system. So basically, in some sense, you and I started like this as well. All of our dust comes from something very similar. Which of course makes this iconic image from the Hubble Space Telescope even more iconic. And so I'm actually super happy NASA released this, because it shows us these unusual eggs and, I guess, star incubators in a very different light. And I guess what's even more important is that this is not an artistic representation, this is actually based on physical evidence and telescopic observations, specifically on various images that help us understand how the structure looks in three dimensions. And because we're looking at this in visible light but also infrared light, it also becomes possible to measure the temperature. Surprisingly, this is not very hot. The core is only about 20 Kelvin, the gas around it is only about 60 Kelvin, and it's only in the outer shell that seems to be a little bit warmer, anywhere from 250 to 320 Kelvin, so this gas is not even that hot, implying that this is all just new gas coalescing into eggs that will one day become stars. But you can see that right here, at least one object is already becoming a star because it seems to be a little bit hotter. And right here we even see jets coming out of another young stellar object that's still growing and still developing, spewing out extra mass from two directions. 
But because we observe these phenomena in pretty much all molecular clouds out there, this basically highlights that it's a universal phenomenon and seems to be the main formation mechanism for a lot of stars similar to our Sun. And so studying these objects and trying to understand what happens in them and how all of this develops will hopefully help us understand how the solar system formed, how it evolved, and why eventually, for some reason, planet Earth formed as well. Because that's really one of the biggest questions here. How do stars form terrestrial planets, and do many of these stars located in these nebula possess similar structures and similar planets once they finish forming? And though there is no answer yet, the obvious implication seems to be yes. But this is why we have James Webb Space Telescope that's going to be trying to answer these questions for the next 20 years. And so once we get more images and potentially more discoveries coming from various clouds, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.